With Brian Flores, we are in completely uncharted territory, and I want to at least try to explain what he is doing. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You liked it on three, one, two, three. You, liked it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much to those of you who do listen to this show every single day. My hashtag every day is I love hearing from you. If you are new here, hello, what's up? My name is Luke. I'm your host. You can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening place like Sirius XM. We're partnered with them. You can also hear all Vikings games on Sirius XM. Just download the SXM app or sign up in your radio in your car if you get it there. Um, you can also find the show on YouTube and Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So as we are still kind of in the buy, I do not have a game to recap. I hope you all enjoyed the uh, bye week red zone uh, treat that we all got. Although it was kind of a weird week of games. Um. So in lieu of that. Let's keep talking about the Brian Flores defense. I talked a little bit about it last week in terms of like how they did on Monday Night Football against the Bears, but it's been a whole week since that game, so I want to sort of zoom out and go broad strokes. I have a plan for this week, um, so I'll lay it out for you now, like right at the outset. So today I want to talk about Brian Flores in fronts, and in particular, how he uses alignment and fronts to confuse quarterbacks. Um, and what he is doing that is just so gosh darn revolutionary that's got everybody talking so much. I think, and I've been guilty of this too, we've gotten too enamored with Brian Flores blitzes a lot. That's not the only innovative thing going on here. And I, I want to explain to you why it's so innovative and what the like status quo is and, and how he's subverting that. So there's all kinds of cool stuff that... Um, I, I frankly cannot wait to talk to you about. Um, tomorrow will be Twitter Tuesday. We'll do that like normal. So get your questions in. Uh, Luke Brown NFL or at Lockdown Vikings on Twitter. And then you can send an email to Lockdown Vikings podcast at gmail.com if you have something longer or similarly, you can fill out the Google form, which is always linked in the show notes. Leave a YouTube comment too. I'll get your questions there. Might just answer it right there or I'll save it for Twitter Tuesday if I want to talk about it on the show. Um, so we'll do Twitter Tuesday and then on Wednesday, I'll go to like the coverage side of it. So we'll do the kind of front seven, the run defense, all that stuff today. And then the front side of the, or the coverage side of things on Wednesday. And by Thursday, it'll be crossover Thursday. We'll be in Raiders mode and we, uh, we'll be back in the normal cadence of things. Okay. Sound good. Good. Sounds like a plan. So, um, fronts, the, Reason I'm going into this much detail right now is not only because it's the bye week, but also because there was a piece that came out by Kevin Seifert over the weekend that connected a couple dots for me that just like exploded the entire world <laughs> and, and everything uh, fills out from there. In particular, uh, I'll link this in the show notes as well. If I forget, please yell at me. But it's an ESPN story about um, Brian Flores adapting or adopting a college defense. I guess both adopting and adapting a college defense. And in particular, the one from Pat Narduzzi, because he's at Pitt. And this is something that Brian Flores was really exposed to when he was with the Steelers because they shared some facilities. So he was really exposed to the Pat Narduzzi stuff that they are doing over there at Pitt and uh, got inspired and decided to couch some of those ideas and incorporate them into his own defense. Uh, if that sounds like a sly thing or like something underhanded, I, I, I want to make it extra sure that you understand that it is just how it works. That is not sly or underhanded at all. That is a very well uh, established phenomenon. Everyone steals from everyone. That's why they call it a copycat league. So when I say stuff like oh, we stole this or couch this idea and stuff like that, that's um, that's a really normal. And if I'm being honest, encouraged thing. I think that that's good that he stole ideas from a college defense and found a way to adapt them to an NFL game. That's like a really hard thing to do because the world is so different 
Um, in particular, making the coverages work is really hard, but we will get to that. I just don't have time today. Um, but one of the things in particular that that Pitt does is six man fronts. I'm actually, I'll just read you a quote here from this Kevin Seifert article, which you should read the entirety of because it goes into a lot of detail of some other stuff. But Seifert writes, and I quote, he incorporated a version of the defense popularized at the college level by Pittsburgh coach Pat Narduzzi, one that combines a six-man front with versions of zone coverage behind it. The, the typical, the classic thing is that if you're going to load up the line of scrimmage, you play man coverage behind it. That's just kind of the normal way to do things. It's something Bill Belichick does a lot. Um, it's something that Vic Fangio does a lot. Some of the very like established defensive coordinators will load the front and play man coverage behind it. Playing zone coverage behind it is kind of insane. It's a little bit of driving without a seatbelt, which is how we've been describing Flores all year. Um, and figuring out a way to make that work is very uh, much like the, the kind of philosophy that he took from Pittsburgh. But it's, today I want to talk about the six-man front thing. Because a six-man front is, is an idea that when I first read that in the article, I was like, six man? Oh! Like that made the, the wheels turn about the way that that Flores and the Vikings think about fronts and to understand it I have to go over some of the basic fronts that like if you don't know you should know so we can all get on the same page and uh then we can kind of talk about how Flores subverts that norm that we just talked about so normal fronts um typically teams will sort of have a, a base front, right? 4-3 or a 3-4, we'll say. Those are the sort of like a 4-3 under or a 4-3 over. You can probably imagine a 4-3, four, four defensive linemen with three linebackers behind it, right? Uh, and under and over just tells you which side the nose tackle is on and which side the three technique is on, the, the other defensive tackle. Just tells you where the defensive tackles are. And I don't need to go for an over they're closer to the tight end for an under, they're further away from the tight end. That's that's the whole deal of over and under. And then you'll have a 3-4, which is a lot of the same deal, but again, it is over and under depending on where the three technique is. If you want to know over and under, look at the three technique. So the guy between the tackle and the guard, if he is on the same side as the tight end, it is an over. If he is not, it is an under. There is your rule for 3-4 and 4-3 over and under. That's what it tells you. And if there's two... Uh, there's two three techniques, two defensive tackles is probably a different front. Some of this can just become like a memorization game, and it, that's not very fun uh, to podcast about. So I'm not just going to like start listing and explaining fronts here, but understand that typically you'll either live in a world where you've got four people on the line of scrimmage, four defensive linemen on the line of scrimmage, and then in a three four front in the oldest, oldest version, the classic version from, you know, way back when, it would be three people on the line of scrimmage and four linebackers. Nowadays, that's more like two of those linebackers are actually edge rushers. Like, it, Daniel Hunter is a quote-unquote linebacker in this world, right? Um, so it still kind of works out with those two guys on the edges, but you still have three quote-unquote defensive linemen, so it turns a little bit more into like a 5-2. And that's the way I would describe it to someone if I were trying to teach for the first time what a 3-4 what a, a, a over and under front are. I would say it's a 5-2, not a 3-4. And that's the way the Vikings have lived, right? Five defensive linemen. I'm not going to... I refuse to call Daniel Hunter a linebacker. Um, through five defensive linemen and then like Ivan Pace and Jordan Hicks behind them, or I guess it's now Ivan Pace and like Troy Dye um, behind that. So when I think four down front, I think Mike Zimmer, you know, Griffin and Hunter and then like uh, Linval Joseph and I, Sharif Floyd, right? Or like Tom Johnson or whatever. There's your four guys and they're your guys. And this is what the Vikings ran for like ever. I don't think they ran a three, four except in the eighties up until now. Um, now you have sort of five down where you've got your Harrison Phillips and then like Tonga and Bullard. And then on the outside, you've got like DJ Wanham and Daniel Hunter uh, or Marcus Davenport when he's healthy. Like you've got those. So there's your five guys. Six man front. That's kind of weird, right? So there's a lot of different ways to get to a six man front. But to understand how the Vikings sort of took that idea and said, we're going to actually put another guy in the mix on the line of scrimmage and how they can do that without getting screwed by the, uh, the offense just attacking wherever that guy left from, um, you have to kind of understand the idea of a base front and what I mean when I say like basing out of 4-3 under or basing out of um, you know 3-4 tight or whatever, which is kind of what the Vikings tried to do last year. Um, 
And once you kind of understand that idea, then it all starts to click in place how Flores sort of adds and tacks on little bells and whistles to the fronts. And we're just talking about alignment here and how that can like confuse quarterbacks. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy made easy. So if you've been thinking about getting into therapy, but perhaps you're a little bit intimidated by maybe some of the stories that you've read about people who've had bad experiences with therapy and said, I don't, it's not for me. A lot of those people will just try one therapist and have a bad experience and assume all therapy is like that. But you would be stunned to find the difference from one specialist to another and how one person can really fit your needs and one person really can't. So actually like try a whole bunch. They have a, a little questionnaire that gets you matched with someone. And if it doesn't work, they'll help you find someone else until you find somebody that does work. They really want to get you hooked up. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. Thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. Uh, if this sort of topic interests you, I'm working on a larger explainer that goes into a much more comprehensive detail uh, over on Patreon, and I'll probably spin it into something at Wide Left as well. So patreon.com slash NFL. If you join me, you can always watch that stuff there. When this show ends, if you're watching on YouTube, you will be redirected to the Locked On Minnesota Sports 24-7 live stream it is all locked on minnesota shows from this show wolves wild uh all the locked on minnesota sports roundtables and stuff all on a loop in a 24 7 feed just kick that thing on put it on in the background while you work and uh just let her run it is a 24 7 feed that is constantly up updated with the new episodes of all of those shows pretty cool stuff uh if you are not watching on youtube you can find that on the locked on minnesota sports youtube channel okay so the base front that the Vikings had for years and years and years and years, I'm pre-Zimmer all the way through the 90s, basically. Actually thinking about it, I want to say like since Tony Dungy, but it might even be before that, was 4-3. The Vikings were a 4-3 team and, and their base front would be either a 4-3 over or a 4-3 under depending on if the other team liked to run strong or weak more. Essentially, if you like to run toward the tight end, we'll put our guys kind of shaded over that way and vice versa. Um, that was the way for a long time. That is still the way that a lot of NFL teams do it. That's still the way a lot of college teams do it. It's a very solid way to do things. It is the Mickey Mouse of front structures. It is the default for a reason. Um, there's also three, four, which you could call like the mini mouse also kind of the default kind of for the same reason, um, which is, you know, three, four under three, four, uh, nowadays the real in thing to do is three, four tight or three, four mint, which are fairly similar fronts that have three guys either head up or inside of the tackles. Um, so you'll have like a nose tackle that's usually like at a zero tech, maybe shaded on one side or the other of the center. And then like two guys between each tackle and guard. Right. And that's really, really difficult to run into. It's a very good uh, counter to wide zone stuff because of the way that the gaps work out and because of how difficult that makes the job on guards in particular, which are often a an underinvested position. Like nobody's picking their first round guards. Right. A lot of those guys are day two guys. Um, or not, they definitely don't make as much money. So kind of attacks that. And that's why that's such an in thing right now. It's what the Packers are doing. It's, I don't think it's what the bears are doing. It's what the Vikings did last year. Uh, chargers, all the Fangio teams, right? Everybody wants to do what Vic Fangio did with those famously great 2018 bears on defense. So all that said, most teams have like an identity of their base front. And it's truly like how it's how they'll introduce their starters on defense, right? So most teams will have an identity, right? When you think of the the Zimmer defense, like if I recall the way that they ins they would uh, list the Zimmer defense on Madden was attacking 4-3. That was a 4-3 defense and that was the base. And if you ever saw another front, they were doing something different there. Right on third down, they would widen out those four guys. They would put two linebackers on the A gaps and they would they would sugar the A gaps. It was a I think they called it sugar front, or they would at least say like you're sugaring the A gaps. Um, 
that is it, it would all be like variations on the base thing which is four three the vikings one of the first teams i can remember that doesn't have a true base front and it's not just that sometimes they do over and sometimes they do under it's that they are a 4-3 team and a 3-4 team. This has been a Flores thing for a while. He did do this in Miami, so I guess I do remember those. Um, but basically, some teams, depending on the kinds of run plays that they like to do, are going to be better against 4-3 or better against 3-4. So Flores has taken different fronts to different games. For example, if you go watch the Saints game and you just look at the fronts that they did, they will be in a 4-3 structure a lot of the time to start and then they'll uh, rotate and they'll shift to other things. And this is how the six man front comes in. But if you look at the Broncos game, for example, they'll be in a three, four and they actually did some pretty cool stuff in the run game in that one. I was kind of traveling, so I didn't get to talk about it, but basically they, uh, in, instead of trying to overtake the reach blocks, they actually had the defense step against the run action every play. And that's how they absolutely crushed that run game. Uh, because essentially every single defensive lineman was backdooring. It was it was really, really cool game plan stuff. Um, and such a shame that they couldn't win that game because there's a really cool coaching thing going on. But um, that was front front wise. They were a three four team against Denver. And then they I think they were a five oh team when they played San Francisco, for example, five oh or I, I'll call it a Panther. I think their word for it is Panther because it's from Pitt. And that is one where they will have a nose tackle straight up on the center. And then they'll actually have somebody to the gap to the outside of every other lineman. And that forces a 5-0 look. That's why my brain calls it a 5-0 look because there is a Coach Vass, if you know the Make Defense Great Again podcast video on um, Brian Flores that calls that look 5-0. And I think that's the Belichick word for it. And I think they call it Panther now because we're a little bit more Pat Narduzzi-ish. Don't worry about too much about the words or anything like that. But just know sometimes I'll say 5-0, sometimes I mean Panther. Those are the same things. Uh, and I'm sorry for making it confusingly two terms. It's just my brain failing me. <laughs> but the, the Panther look, the point of that is to basically put one guy that each offensive lineman feels he is responsible for so that they can't slide any protections. They can't slide away from that guy. Each person is sort of pinned down by saying, yeah, but there's a guy outside of me. I'm covered. I can't be part of the slide. And it makes it a lot harder to call protections and a lot easier to blitz. It, against uh, San Francisco, it was. Yeah, against San Francisco, they lived in that look. That was their base front was 5-0. Um, and it didn't matter who was pulling and who was shifting and who was motioning and all that. Uh, they would still be in those gaps. And essentially, it freed up the linebackers to react to all that other pre-snap stuff that was going on. And it didn't have the, the same effect, like anchored the, the front down, the defensive line down, so that all those motions and shifts that San Francisco is doing that they want specifically to like move tackles and move edges over and, and get guys to shift a certain way. They would never do that shift. And the 49ers never got the look that they wanted. Um, so it, it makes the defense this kind of chameleon that they can line up in certain fronts and, and base out of that, but then add those other people like as the snap uh, comes so that even once you do figure out what's what front structure you're going to see all day, which like if you're the Raiders right now, you don't know. You don't know if you're going up against a 3-4-3 team or a 3-4 team or a 5-0 team or or something else or 6-1 stuff, which is what the, the six-man front refers to. You have no idea what you're going to see all day because the Vikings have shown all of these for an entire game. Um, that's really, really difficult to prepare for. So that's part of what's really cool about this defense and how it is working so well. Another thing I'm going to take from the uh, Seaford article is statistically since week four. So the first three weeks they had some, uh, Seifert called it fine tuning to do. So the first three weeks, some rough stuff went down, right? That Eagles game where they gave up a bunch of rush yards and then they gave up like record pass yards against the chargers. And then they did some adjustments since that fifth in points per game, fifth in yards per play, third in EPA. Uh, that's from ESPN stats and info. It, insane success since that fine tuning session after the Chargers kind of ripped him a new one. Um, that all stems from 
being difficult to prepare for in this way of being this chameleon that can become a 3-4 team, a 4-3 team. And it's what Flores talked about at the outset of the season. So probably should just listen to him. Um, so, okay, this whole thing has been about six-man fronts. How does they come in? Okay, that's now we're going to drive this home and actually get to that. That'll be next. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is a great place to get last minute tickets. I had a huge headache recently trying to get tickets for the upcoming game uh, to the Raiders uh, to, in, in Las Vegas. My dad and I are going to go to Vegas and, and attend that game. And we were trying to figure out tickets in like August and it was already hard. So if you want to go to an NFL game at the last minute, those prices are going to be gouged to absolute heck. So a place like this is pretty important. Get those last minute seats, those flash deals where they won't be marked up as as hard at all. And they have a game time guarantee, which means you will always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference. Uh, they've got their zone deals where you pick the section and then game time will pick the seats for you for an average of 18% savings because they know how to navigate exactly how stadiums price out their tickets and how those tickets go up and down on certain markets and stuff. They'll do all of that for you. So download the Game Time app and take the guesswork out of buying tickets. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So going into this six man front thing that has broken my brain as much as it has, um, I want to take for an example, the Saints game, both because the Saints are a relatively normal offense, like the Bears game isn't a great example because their game plan was so weird, and nor is the 49ers because that's, a, again, like a weird offense that doesn't look a lot like the other ones, but but the Saints run things fairly straight up. And that means that it's a pretty good example to study on how defenses respond and how they kind of want to live in a more controlled scenario. Um, so f they based out of 4-3 in that one. So a lot of times it would be a 4-3 over front. So they would have the three technique on the same side as the tight end and a nose tackle on the opposite side and then two edges outside the tackles. That was their base front. A few things they would do to make it, quote, six men on the line of scrimmage. For one, they would mug the mug the gaps with the linebackers. Now, those linebackers wouldn't just mug the A gaps like the Zimmer thing that we saw with Barr and Kendricks for years and years. Sometimes it would be the A and the B. Sometimes it would be both Bs. Sometimes it would be both As. But they would kind of be wherever the defensive linemen weren't. There would be two linebackers essentially threatening blitz. And a lot of times they would back off and play a normal linebacker game. Sometimes they would come and blitz. Um, and that became kind of part of what makes it difficult. So that's one way to do it. But one of the things that they absolutely loved to do was shift into, I'm going to use the word tilt for the front. It's the Fangio word for this because it was very much popularized by Fangio. Uh, this is something that Donatel did as well. It's something that Fangio's doing over in Miami too and has been for years, um, which is 6-1. So if you take a 4-3 and you take the two outside linebackers, I'm talking 4-3 outside linebackers, you know, Eric Wilson, right? The Sam and the Will, Anthony Barr back in the day. Um, those two would then walk down and threaten outside of the edge rushers. So you could call this a 2-4-5 if you prefer to, uh, and you want to call those guys linebackers. But that would create six men on the line of scrimmage. To me, that is a tilt front if you have... Um, your four down linemen with two not D line guys that can, they can be linebackers. It's often Metellus, which is a, just a very Vikings -y thing to do right now. It's, it's not like super normal to make that a safety, but the Vikings do it a ton because it's Metellus and they ask him to do everything. Um, and run the tilt front. The, the most famous usage of the tilt front was it was basically how the Patriots beat the Rams in the Super Bowl a few years ago. If you remember that one, that was like 13 to three. It was this crazy defensive thing. 
Belichick used the tilt front. So it's really good against these wide zone defenses. And it's sort of the reason the Vikings thought Ed Donatel would be a good idea was because that front is so popular and it's still happening. But the Vikings aren't just lining up in it this year. They're taking guys and, and walking them down. That was the most popular presentation they gave the Saints for the entire first half. Um, game started to warp kind of after that. So I only did the first half for the purposes of this because I felt like that was more neutral. And for that, that was like by far the most popular front they did. And then I clicked on the, the Broncos game to watch the same thing. And I never saw it. I think I saw it like once. Like <laughs> It was a completely different game plan. And so being able to come out in, in different fronts like that and not necessarily having a quote unquote identity in terms of the front makes it really, really hard to game plan for the Vikings. How do you run on that? Because you don't know what you're going to see. You don't know who's going to be in one gap, in what gap, and you don't know what run plays will work well against that. Um, other ways to get to a six-man front, let's say that they are basing out of 4-3, or out of 3-4, uh, which means the normal world is to have five guys on the line of scrimmage, from the nose tackle to, you know, the Bullard and the Tonga to the Didney Hunters and, and the DJ Wanums. Um... Those five guys on the line of scrimmage, and they'll be shifted one way or another, depending on its o if it's over or under. And then you'll have, I'm going to use the word a bandit. I don't think that's always the right word. I think some people will call it a stud on the other side. Some people will call it a joker that comes down. There's all kinds of different words. I'm going to use bandit. I apologize if that is the wrong word to you. But essentially, that is a person who comes in from the second level, from the back six of coverage, basically and joins the party on the line of scrimmage to become that sixth man, often on the side that the Vikings have shifted to. So against the Bears, if they have taken their five guys and they shifted it over, right, that they lived in a 3-4 in, a in the Bears, that's right. And let's say they shifted it away from the tight end, so 3-4 under. Um, they will then bring down, it could be Harrison Smith, Metellus, it was Troy Dye sometimes, it was Pace sometimes, whoever that is will come down to the line of scrimmage and be like a sixth man to the outside of that tackle to the shift side, the call side, you might, you might call it. And so that person was completely unblocked. Against the Bears, it was almost always Metellus. And they essentially put Metellus on Justin Fields' duty for that game by having him be that overhang is another word, like that overhang defender. That extra guy on the edge that isn't accounted for by the offensive alignment, whose sole job would be to worry about the quarterback keep, basically. That was his whole job was to try to worry about Justin Fields running against him. And whenever they were in that front, it discouraged that run, and, and Justin Fields would always give it away. He got some other runs on him in other presentations. But for this, that was kind of their deal. And essentially what you get is two off the edge. So if the defense want, or if the offense wants to run away from where you've shifted, you have two guys on the backside. One can freely pursue and chase it down. That guy's often Daniil Hunter. He's kind of quick. And one of them is taking away the subversion to this, which is... Uh, the, the QB run that goes away from all the action. Well, there's two guys over there. You cannot do that cutesy thing. You have to run this straight up. And by the way, Daniil Hunter is chasing you while you do it. And that worked really, really well against the Bears. So uh, there's your three ways to get to like a six-man front. But what I want you to really take home from all this, if all of this has your like head spinning, A, that's kind of the by design. It's supposed to make your head spin. Hopefully it's making the Raiders head spin right now. That's kind of why they want it to be so difficult to put together. But for me, what is most impressive is that the Vikings very rarely screw this up. The They have this stuff correct. The impacts that it has on run defense, They I haven't even gotten to the way that they exchange gaps and the way that they will do run stunts and, and pass stunts, which are different things. Um, run stunts typically have uh, a defensive lineman and a linebacker exchanging gaps, whereas pass stunts are just the pass rushers, right? Um, and how all of that incorporates and adds additional layers of complexity. That's your like actual play calls. I'm just talking about like the formation and how complicated things can get. So one of the questions that I'm going to need to start asking as I scout out these teams and as I preview games is what front 
are the Vikings going to use against the Raiders? And then I'll ask the same about the Bengals and Lions and so on. What front are they going to want to be in against those teams is a really interesting question. And it's kind of the question that those teams are going to have to ask and figure out and probably not have a certain definitive answer to uh, because it's it's unpredictable. Um, this is not a precedented world. This six men live in this, steal it from Pitt. It's never been in the pros. It's only ever been in college, at least according to the Seaford article. And he asked around to a bunch of defensive guys who couldn't remember this being like something anywhere else ever. Um, even the stuff that Flores did in Miami, it didn't have this six man element to it. I think that's unbelievably cool. And it's if it continues to work as well as it is working, and if it works next year, whether it's in Minnesota or not, I don't know where Brian Flores will be, then it could become the next revolution of defense. We got a long way to go to do that, but this is a new enough idea to get that consideration if it really catches on. Can't wait to see it. Don't forget to get your questions into me uh, for Twitter Tuesday. I'm going to kind of go into the how this uh, affects coverage and blitz and stuff on Wednesday, and then we're into Raiders mode. Can't wait to see it all out with you. And as always, Skull.